Good morning. Welcome. We are getting ready to get started here. So why don't you go ahead and stand as we jump in right with our first song. I know it always probably seems like sometimes we say we're going to start something and then we just stand here. There is a reason for that. We have music in our ears also. So sometimes when we're like, let's get going. And then there's like a whole few seconds of us just being like, and then we jump in. That's usually why. So we were hearing music in our ears there. So we're not going crazy. We're going to start from the top again. You guys are going to stand up. You're going to clap. We're going to get into it. Okay. Thank you. 
morning, good morning. Welcome to St. Matthew. If you have never been here today, my name is Becca. You also may be looking for Marker, Marker, Marco. He is our director of worship arts. He actually is out of town this weekend. He was at his graduation for his doctorate degree uh, this weekend. So it is a huge weekend for him. So we are here cheering him on and very excited and also excited to be here singing with you guys. Um, so if you are new today, we have our welcome cards. You're welcome to fill those out. We would love to get to know you. There's also a space there to share prayer requests with us. That's available online as well. Those can be dropped, up, dropped off up at the welcome table. Um, if you're new, they've got a gift for you, and we would just love to find ways that we can get connected with you here at St. Matthew. And then I'm going to invite Pastor Brad up for our confession. So confession, absolution. When we confess our sins, remember who we are. We hear God's word of forgiveness. Remember who he is. <laughs> Have you guys had one of these? They're really, really good. I have to admit, I was kind of struggling with what I wanted to talk about, the Confession of So she said, you know, with a thing like Mother's Day, we, we have this great gift, you know, and we somehow don't think it's a gift of God. You know, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And so we gobble it up, we think it's all about up, and then we wonder why we end up kind of empty, you know? Uh, these are great, by the way. Y'all try one. And you can eat it all, and it's okay. It, uh, under the roof here, there's, once you get in church, there's no sugar or fat or anything to these things. It's, it's, it's all good for you. Um, the other thing on a day like this is uh, we focus on the brokenness all around us. Um, I'm tempted to focus on the idea I got nobody to celebrate Mother's Day with. Because both my mother and my wife were taken home to heaven in six months. Or somebody else really struggles because they didn't have a mom that was what she was supposed to be. Or a mom bears guilt that she wasn't what she wanted to be. Or those who struggle today because they weren't able to have children. In all those places, Jesus comes to us. It's so important. I, I go back to uh, when Jesus was at the funeral of Lazarus. You remember he wept there? He wept uh, in our brokenness with us. And then he rose. He, he raised Lazarus from the dead. It's like he filled up the cup again. That's what he does, you see. He washes us clean in his blood and forgives us of our sins. And then like a resurrection, we can begin brand new to love his gifts, enjoy his gifts, and to share his gifts with those around us. Because finally, if you feel broken today, Jesus won for you. Um, and if you feel joyful today, Remember, it's a gift from him to live in. So I declare to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You guys really ought to try one of these. They're really good. <laughs> you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the song. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. Child. 
awesome. All right, guys, we are going to take a couple minutes. Why don't you guys look to the person next to you, say hello to someone you have not met. It is going to be time for our kids to come on up for the children's message. So get ready to come on up, kids, as your parents are greeting those around you. And then you guys are welcome to go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Well, some of your parents are awake out there. Are you guys awake? Yes, yes. You say good morning? Oh, our kids are kind of waking up. Hey, have you guys tried the new lavender latte thing that's for Mother's Day? It's kind of good, actually. And I realize I should not be admitting that, but whatever. It was good. All right. So we're going to talk about moms and dads this morning. What are some things that our moms and dads give us. Somebody know something our moms and dads give us? Yes. They give us presents. Okay, good, good. Do they give you presents all the time? No. Okay. What are the things they give you all the time? What's some of the moms and dads give us? Love. Good. That's a very good one. That's a great one. What do moms and dads give us? Food. Yes. Excellent. What else do moms and dads give us? What? Care. Care. They care for us. Good, good. All right. I'll give you a hint. There is, you have a a first name and a last name. Our parents give us our last name too. Yeah. What else do our parents give us? What is something else? Love. We got love. Yep. Your first. Well, they named you too. That's good. Yep. They gave your first name. That's good. How about, how about this? This is from uh, 2 Timothy. Um, chapter 1, verse 5. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I am now persuaded lives in you also. In other words, one of the most important things, if not the most important thing, along with all those other things that our parents give us, particularly moms give us, they can give us faith. Faith in Jesus that saves us. And so God gives us the gift of faith through our parents who pass it down to us. And so we're going to say a prayer and thank God for parents who give us all kinds of good things, but also pass faith on to us and ask that God would help us pass our faith on to others. Okay, so I'll say a couple of words and you guys say them after me, all right? Dear God, thank you for parents, for moms and dads who pass faith to us. Help us to pass the faith to others. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, you guys can head on out to Children's Church right that way, and we'll continue with our next song. Thank you guys for coming up.
Thank you, Jen. <laughs> My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> the people don't know exactly know what the response to that one should be. I kind of noticed that after I said it. I was like, huh, what are they going to say to this? I am Nathan. I have the privilege of being uh, one of the pastors here. And um, we're continuing our series this morning, our series, uh, The River, where we talk about uh, the movement of God uh, following the death and resurrection of Jesus. We see God in the move in the book of Acts. And we're seeing this, this river that starts flowing with Jesus and his disciples and, and how the kingdom of God spreads. And sometimes spreads in the, the most unlikely or seemingly improbable ways. And it doesn't spread the way that, that we maybe think it should. And, and the ways of the world, 
And, and yet if we really think about it, the ways of God, the ways that the kingdom does advance actually works. It works in our lives just as it did in those days. And if we have eyes to see, we can see the kingdom of God advancing even here and now, even today. But before we get to that, I want to take just a moment and um, share with you some words from uh, First, Second Timothy. I was going to say, yeah, nope, First Timothy, sorry about that, yeah. Second Timothy, you're right, it's up there, huh? So, uh, 2 Timothy, um, we, Pastor Brad all times will talk about uh, home huddles and, and how to, to bless kids. One of the things that we talk about doing there is, is blessing kids. Well, this is, this is a blessing that, that Paul speaks over Timothy and, and perhaps an example of, of something you could speak over others in your life uh, to bless them. And so I want to share with you these words. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as your ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears. Here's the idea that they lived through some tough stuff together. Recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith. Which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And the reason I wanted to share those words is it's always caught my attention that here, as, as Paul is talking to Timothy, he picks up the faith that was passed down from his grandmother to his mother, and now to Timothy. And that's one of the things that is nearest and dearest to most parents' hearts. Is that their children would love this Jesus that you love. And that they would have this faith in them that you have in you. And yet I'm also aware that there's many people in here who, um, whose children have wandered from the faith. Whose children have heard the message and yet taken another path for a time. And I'm reminded of those words that Jesus claims for himself in the New Testament that was spoken by Isaiah the prophet as part of one of the servant psalms. In Isaiah chapter 42, where it says of this servant, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Jesus cares about those whose faith is weak, those whose faith is, is uh, faltering. And he loves them and wants to draw them back into the family. And so as we start off uh, this Mother's Day message, I want to start with a prayer about that. Gracious Heavenly Father, lift up to you those whose hearts are burdened. Burdened by um, children that are no longer actively practicing the faith and following after you. And Lord, we know that you have a heart for them. And as much as moms long for them to be back in the family. You long for them to be back part of your family even more. And so, Lord, we pray for them. We pray for the parents who pray for them. And we ask that you would work, that your spirit would move, and that you would shine your love and your grace back into their lives, that they might once again live a life after you. In the name of Jesus, amen. I want to share you uh, with you one of these images. Uh, you got anybody else out to remember the magic eye images? Those those images like this, or as I like to refer them, magic torture eye devices, because um, they'd always show me these, and I actually did eye therapy for a while, and this was part of my eye therapy. And they're like, "Can't you see the image?" I'm like, "No, I don't see the image. 
you are just people playing an evil joke on me. There's nothing there. And you're all trying to say, I think there's something there. I think I can see it. If you can see it, you're doing better than I can because I can't see it. And, and I think that's sometimes the story. I hope there's something good up there. Um, that's sometimes the story and the challenge with God and his work in our world. Is that we can't see what we're not looking for. And, and there's ways that you could tell the story, the story that we're going to read from Acts, and that, that it would look like the church is losing, that it would look like God's getting pushed out and the battle is over and nothing's going the way as planned. And yet through the eyes of faith, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, saw what God was doing. And the cracks and the places where, where God was on the move. And as we start off in this subject and on this topic, uh, there's three things that we need to notice or be aware of to see the movement of God. The first thing is that God uses the humble. That's God's way of doing stuff. He starts with those who are humble. Secondly, the church is not a building. And then third, the church grows when the water flows. Kind of like those signs that you see along the highway where water flows, plants grow. Kind of like that. Where the water, the church grows where the water flows. And if the water is not flowing, the water of the river, then the church is not growing. And so let's start in Acts chapter 6, verses 6, 1 through 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing... The Hellenistic Jews, among them, complained against the Hebraic Jews because their windows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And and so what we've got here is we've got two formerly Jewish, now Christian groups, part of the church, that are disagreeing. Of course, that never happens in the church today. We don't have any disagreements in the church today at all. I think sometimes the problem with disagreements in the church, and and maybe this is just the kind of Midwest in me, is that that we like to sweep them under the rug. We like to pretend that it's okay, that there's nobody upset with anybody else, and that probably causes more problems than it solves. But here they bring it to the front. And and so the idea is you have Hellenistic Jews, and so these are, are Jews that are now Christians that have embraced the Greek languages, the Greek traditions, the Greek culture, who've taken Greek names, and so they fit into the culture at large. They were still Jews, but now they become Christians, but they had embraced all the culture around them. And then you have the Hebraic Jews. And these were ones that held to the language and the tradition and the culture that they'd inherited. The Hebrew culture, the Hebrew language, with Hebrew names. And so you have two very different groups of people. It's no surprise they had a problem. Because sometimes that's what happens when you have two different groups of people. They start looking for, okay, there's got to be an issue here. They're looking for a reason to disagree with one another, to not get along. And so they find something. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together. And so the disciples get everybody together, which is probably not a very big group of people at this point in time if they're getting them all together. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. This job they're going to give somebody to do doesn't sound like it's very important. Somebody said, hey, we shouldn't neglect this other big important task to wait on tables. Would you be signing up to wait on tables? Like, hey, this is the job that I want. So so we were hearing like, okay, this doesn't seem like this is something that's very important. This is a, a menial task, an unimportant task, but it's still one that needs to be done. So we better find somebody to do it. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them, and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, 
Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, and they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Notice there, notice there that all those names are not Hebrew names. Those are Greek names. They chose people that were worried about the problem, that were concerned about the problem. Therefore, they would have passion and want to solve the problem. They chose people that were interested in making a difference. They were interested in in their own people being overlooked, and they turned it over to them. And then it goes on, so the word of God spread. The numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to God. What I think is is really incredible here is it says, so the word of God spread. What's the thing that changed? What's the thing that's happening? A daily food distribution. That's it. And the word of God spread. And so what's happening is small deeds done faithfully. And the people around are saying, hey, there's something going on here. There's something at work here where where people are being cared for in a way that we have not seen before. And and look at how these people that we're fighting with one another, who, who don't speak the same language anymore, something is drawing them together and we're seeing something. Something that's attractive, something that we want part of our life. But it's small deeds done faithfully. And then it says, a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Think about that for just a moment. Men who have have dedicated their entire lives to to the service of the synagogue, to the, the Hebrew scriptures, to the Old Testament, to the traditions that had been passed down to them. These were the gatekeepers. These were the ones that were in charge of upholding the tradition of the Hebrew faith. Jews of Jews. And and they come to faith. What is going on? What is touching them that they're saying, huh, this Jesus that they're talking about, maybe he's the real deal. What's opening up their eyes? It's those small deeds done faithfully. And they're seeing something I would say is even more. Read in Psalm 68, 68, where we hear about the character of God, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. See, I think what the priests were really seeing is they were seeing the character of God in the people of God. And they were were seeing God himself, and they're saying, I think I've read about this kind of thing. I think I've seen this kind of thing. And this must mean that this is God's presence here, and God is among these people. So maybe this Jesus is really this God that they say that he is. And as they looked, they found out he is. And so they came to faith. And it started with a food distribution. Small deeds done faithfully. People of God were embodying the character of God. And the church spread. And so as we think about God using the humble, there's three things. Three things that are are part of that. The first is that, that God uses the humble, and and he invites us to identify with the lowly. Because that's what God does. I mean, that's what the incarnation is about. It's not about us climbing our way up to heaven to bring Jesus down, but rather Jesus comes down to us. He chooses to identify with the lowly. I mean, that's what that verse was all about. It's all about God identifying with the lowly in status. And that being the character of God all the way from the beginning of the Old Testament until now. This is who God is. He draws near to the lowly. You see, most of the gods of the Old Testament world were about identifying with people in positions of power. 
with kings and rulers on their thrones, but the God of the Old Testament, the God we find in Jesus, draws close to all people. In particular, he has a preferential option for those who are downtrodden, and so consequently, his people will too. Second thing is we all want to belong. Is there anybody out here that doesn't want to belong? No, we all want to belong. But here's the crazy thing about belonging. There is nothing that you can do to make yourself belong, right? I I remember sitting in high school and you look around the lunchroom and you can tell which part, uh, which group people were a part of by the clothes that they wore. (laughs) Anybody else remember that? Anybody else remember the big Jinko jeans? And I lived in the country, and so then there was the, the Jinko jeans group, the skater group, and then there was the, the, the country group. We lived in the farm, and so there was the, the, all the guys with Wranglers and Brutes and uh, country western shirts. And then there was the athletes. And you have all these different groups of people, and they're all trying to fit in. And if we're all honest, none of us really ever felt like we did fit in, right? But the amazing thing about belonging is you can't do anything to make yourself belong, but you can make somebody else belong. You can make someone else feel like they're part of something by the attention that you give them, by the the way that you treat them. You can make someone else belong. You can make someone else fit in by being kind and loving and gracious and being present And paying attention. All this stuff is stuff that I think sometimes moms are particularly good at, especially with kids. And then finally, know your importance. First and foremost, as we talk about that, know that you are a child of God, that you belong to the family of God because of what Jesus has done for you. But the problem is, is that we always want to find our importance Use God for our own purposes, for our own ambitions, and we want to get our importance up here from our position and our status and our power, and we want everybody to respect us and listen to us. And so we climb the career ladder, we climb the social ladder, hoping to find our importance there. And all those places, all those rungs that we would climb up, were entirely replaceable. Pastor Brad or I were to receive a call or to leave or go somewhere. Uh, you see, we'd like to think, well, I'm irreplaceable here. Guess what? You guys would be sad for a little while, probably not as long as I would like. <laughs> and you'd replace me and you'd be all right. You'd look back 10 years after I'm gone and say, oh, Nathan, he was a good guy. But there are places in my life where I'm completely irreplaceable, not the other way around. There are places in my life where I think I want to find my importance, where I'm completely replaceable. Like what I do for my job, what I do here. There are places in my life where I am irreplaceable. As a father to Bree, Elise, and Bo, as a husband to Lindsay, I'm the only one they'll ever have. And that's true with each and every one of us. And I think we spend so much time and so much energy trying to find our importance and our value and our significance in places where we are completely replaceable. And we neglect the places where we are irreplaceable. And so I think the challenge, the invitation, is to think about those places in your life where you are irreplaceable. Those places with your family. Those places with your loved ones. And invest your heart and your life there. And I also think there's, there's moments where you are irreplaceable as well. See, God uses us as his people And there's somebody that that God has placed, will place in your life that that needs to hear something from you that only you can tell them. 
if you'll pay attention, if you'll be present, there's somebody that needs to hear of God's grace and love and peace for you, from you. Because you're the person that he put there to share that message. And it's in relationship, person to person. You are important because you're part of the family of God. You're important to those people that God put closest to you, and you are important, maybe perhaps even the only one, to the people that God will place in your life that they might hear the message of God's grace through you. And I think the other thing that's interesting about this is when God invites us to do small things, Sometimes we say, I don't want to do that. I, I want to do something of importance, something of significance, something great with my life. But where God asks us to start is not often where God leaves us. God wants us to be faithful with the little things because he wants to give us more things that we might grow more into who he has created us to be. I I'm reminded of what Jesus said over and over again, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. And we see that happen with Stephen and with Philip. And I'm sure it happened with the five others whose stories we don't read. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. We see Stephen grow in stature and importance. And God had him start waiting tables and he ends up being called before the Sanhedrin and gives one of these incredible speeches regarding who God is and what God has done through history. A, a speech which we are bled, blessed to be able to read today. And of course, when people grow in importance and power, they clash with authorities. And so Stephen clashes with authorities and the authorities don't like what Stephen is saying. And, and we'll get to more of that in a moment, but God raises up the humble. Over and over again in Scripture, we read that. And I think all too often in our lives, we want to search for significance and importance that God says, just be faithful with this. And when we're faithful with that, he blesses us and gives us more. I think the other thing to remember is that as we live in this world, um, we're also dealing with pers persecution. And, and persecution, uh, not in the overt, crushing way that they had to deal with, but, but persecution of the things that we love and we hold dear. A uh, persecution against our values. And that's, I think, where we are called to lean more into those places where we're important. Lean into our families. Speak this identity that's been given to us into them, that they might know the truth and live in that truth. So Stephen clashes with authorities, and he says this thing, and this is interesting, that this is kind of the big thing that tips the Sanhedrin over the edge, that makes them decide that they should kill him. And uh, here it is from Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 48. However... The Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? That's the thing that gets them upset. That's the thing that gets Stephen in all kinds of trouble with the Sanhedrin, why? Because the Sanhedrin, those are the leaders of the leader, the priests of the priests. They're the ones that are in charge of holding up the system, that are in charge of keeping the system going. And so they're going, wait a second. You're challenging the system. You're challenging the institution. And so we're called to remember that the church is not a building. The church is is the people. And I think we so often forget that in our lives. We run into these places and we think God only works here. No, God doesn't only work here. Of course he works here. He works here through his word, through scripture, through, through baptism. 
He, he works here through the Lord's Supper where we all gather together and receive body, Christ's body and blood and are reminded that we're family. But God is at work everywhere and in every place. God is at work in your home. God is at work in your neighborhood. God is at work in our city. And, and I think we forget that. God is at work in you. After all, remember what Jesus said right before he went up to heaven. Behold, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. And ever will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. And more than that, he pours out his spirit on us. His spirit that we've been seeing what the spirit is doing throughout the book of Acts. That spirit that lived in these people that we've been talking about, that we've been reading about. That spirit's in you. So everywhere that you go, the kingdom of God, the power of God goes with you and before you. And then I think another thing that gets in our way as we think about the church is we think of the church as a place where everything's together, everything's settled, everything's right, because the church never has disagreements about anything. But God wants to use you right where you are, as you are. And the reality is, is all of us have things, stuff, that we think disqualifies us for the mission. Disqualifies us from being the person that can speak the message and the hope of God. Sometimes it, it's stuff that we've done. Sometimes it's, it's our way of being in the world. Sometimes it's our history. Sometimes it's, it's things like, well, I, I've been divorced. I really shouldn't share the good news of Jesus. Well, I've, I've had fights with my kids, and I didn't do a good job raising my kids in the faith, and now they've fallen away. And, and so really, should I be the one that's sharing the faith? Maybe it's struggling with a position at work or, or yelling at the kids and fearing that the neighbors overheard it through the open window. It, all these sorts of things that, that we say, man... I shouldn't talk about Jesus because what if they saw that? What if they knew that? Let me ask you a question. In those broken and painful parts in your heart and your life, do you need the good news of Jesus? Do you need to know that you're forgiven and loved? Guess what? All those people that need to hear about the good news of Jesus from you got all the same stuff. And that's why they need to hear it from you. Because I think sometimes we fall into this trap of thinking, well, I'll take them to church, and then the pastor will tell them about Jesus. The problem with that is I stand up here, and people that don't know me think that I've got it all together. You guys know me, so you know I'm a mess. But the people that don't know me think that I've got it all figured out, that I've got it all right. And that's why they need to hear it from you. Because they know your life's a mess. And they think, well, if Jesus can be for them, I suppose he can be for me too. Right? That's, we need to know the gospel is for us because our lives are a mess. And when people see other people whose lives is a mess, that the gospel is for them, they believe that it can be for them Two, well, why don't we take a moment and pray about that? Because I know that's, that's so hard. Gracious Heavenly Father, we sometimes hesitate to share the good news, to, to live our faith, uh, to let people into our lives because we're afraid we don't have anything to share. Because we're afraid that, that something in us disqualifies us for the mission. Help us to see that that is actually the thing that qualifies us for the mission. Because it's through the broken places in our hearts and our lives that your grace and your love can shine. Lord, help us to see that. In the name of Jesus, amen. I think that goes along with the idea that we often want to have our lives all cleaned up. I'm reminded of a funny story of my lives. 
Does anybody else have a problem with their kids taking all the cushions off the couch? Make them nuts? I've, I'm now the parent that's always putting the cushions back on the couch. When I was younger, I volunteered at a, at a woman's shelter, uh, a safe house. And when I was the only volunteer there, I couldn't take the kids into the playroom with all the toys, so all we had was the couch cushions. So every day, what came off all the couches? All the couch cushions. I drove the staff nuts because they didn't want the kitchens off the couches. But what else was I going to do with like three and four-year-olds? It's not like I was going to... So playing with the kids, and now I've become the person that's always putting the cushions back on the couch. We think our lives need to be cleaned up and mess-free. But it's in the mess. And I think, you know, sometimes mothers are so good at this. It's in the mess where life happens, where we're able to share life, and we don't have to have it all perfect. I want to close with this verse from Acts chapter 8. And Saul, this is a guy that later becomes Paul, approved of their killing of him. That would be Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. We have a tendency to want to hang out with people that are like us. Especially when we become church people. We want to hang out with other church people. Well, guess what? The church people now didn't like them anymore. These apostles and these Jesus people started showing up in synagogues and they started trying to throw rocks at them. So guess what? All these church people, all these Jesus people, not the church people, the church people are the ones trying to kill them. I'm getting my own analogy messed up. These Jesus people start hanging out with people that we wouldn't want to be hanging out with. They start hanging out with people, Simon the sorcerer. Ooh, that sounds like a guy I should bring to church. Nobody says that. But yet, these Jesus people are starting to go to all these places that they've never been and hang out with people that they would never hang out with. And the gospel spreads. It's about us as God's people. Living our lives as followers of Jesus. In each of the pockets and places that he's planted us. And knowing that God's at work in the mess. See, the church grows where the water flows. And the water flows where you step out in grace. Trusting that his spirit is with you and before you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's close with a word of prayer as the band comes up. And gets ready to lead us again. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you use people like us for your mission. Lord, we ask that you would uh, peel back uh, the scales that are on our eyes, allow us to see the, the places where your mission might flourish in our daily lives. We ask that you would help us to step into those places. Help us to be comfortable with the, the messiness and the brokenness. That we might live our life out, our faith out before others. That in us, others might see you. And Lord, help us to do those tasks. No matter how small, that your kingdom might be advanced as they see you in us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, as we get ready to sing this next song, why don't you guys go ahead and stand up and sing with us?
Let's give thanks for these guys, huh? Yeah. So it's Mother's Day. Um, we're singing that song all my life. You have been faithful. And I remember my mom, she died in her sleep two days before she would be 90. She still lived in the home I grew up in. And about a week before that, she, I was on the phone with her and she said, you know, I've been looking back on my life and um, every phase of my life that God has given me, I have thoroughly enjoyed. All my life, he has been faithful. Huh? That's his gift to each of us. Okay, amen? Amen. amen. Yeah. So let's pray. I, 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 magnificent uh, words thoughts that you gave us from God. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to pray uh, about that a little bit. Heavenly Father, we all have such a need to belong. We have a hole inside of us. We're always looking to belong, and we always try to do it ourselves, and in all the wrong ways, it seems. And then you come to us. We can't make ourselves belong. We can't find our way back to you. So you come to us in your son, Jesus Christ. It's a gift. His arms are as wide as the cross. You enfold us into your family. You, through being washed in your blood, you make us belong with you. We praise your name for that. We pray, Lord, that by the power of your spirit, you would give us your heart that we might humble ourselves in those places and moments of our lives when we are irreplaceable, that we might open our arms to that one who needs your grace in that moment. And all God's people say, amen. So I, now I get to pray about Mother's Day, so let, let me do that. Heavenly Father, we... Every good and perfect gift comes down from you. We praise you for uh, the wonderful gift of moms. It is part of your creative goodness. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, the wonderful memories we have, the, the blessings that we enjoy, the joy that we have, uh, all from this gift, and we praise your name. Um, and at the same time, Lord, we understand that we live um, in, in broken lives in a broken world. We we have this wonderful gift, and, and we break it sometimes. Um, we, we come to you in tears in those places, Lord, where, where maybe death has robbed us uh, of our moms, or, or maybe we weren't what we should have been as a child or, or as a mother, or maybe we have great regrets that we can't fix, or maybe we are one that uh, has not been able to have children, the longing of our hearts. Um, in these places, Lord, we, we pray that you might, by your spirit, cause us to remember your presence as you weep with us, as you put your arms around us and walk with us, and as you bring new life, a resurrection, brand new, as you fill up the cup, that we might taste anew in your grace and in your joy, a resurrection that is greater than all brokenness and all shadows. We ask that your spirit would empower us to live there rejoicing in your gift and in your power to make things brand new every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This day we also um, pray for those uh, who are sick. Uh, we pray uh, for Savannah, Ralph and Carolyn, Lenore, Deborah, uh, Linda and Lisa, uh, and also a, a prayer of thanksgiving for some of these folks, like, like Chuck, who is doing so much better. And we also pray for Sylvia, uh, who is uh, having a procedure this coming week. So would, would you pray with me? Dearest Jesus, you are the great healer. Certainly you'll heal every one of us in eternity forever. But Lord, we ask for your healing here and now for these whom we pray for. Um, we ask that you might move powerfully. We boldly ask that you would move. We also pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see where we are irreplaceable in the lives of those for whom we pray and in the lives of those who are sick and hurting around us, that we might bring um, the touch of your love and the healing of your presence into their lives. 
move powerfully, Lord, and heal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yeah, I just want to have a prayer for Marco, too. A pretty cool thing, uh, getting his doctorate. So let, let's do that. Father, we praise your name for Marco. We thank you <laughs> for his ministry with us. Uh, we pray that you might give him joy, not only as he celebrates with his mom this wonderful achievement of his doctorate, even if it's at USC, his doctorate. Uh, <laughs> and we pray, Lord, that you might bring him home safe and that he might um, join us anew uh, in, in our ministry together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As God's people, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And one more short prayer. You know, we have this DCE intern. Uh, uh, we would, uh, uh, a youth minister, a youth pastor intern who's coming in, uh, Julia. Uh, we're the only family she'll have. So pray with me. Father, we thank you for Julia's ministry and her heart, that she is committed to this and that she would actually come to a place where there's no family here except us. We pray, Lord, that we might come alongside her, that you might show us where we are irreplaceable in her life as we come alongside and empower her in the ministry that she is committing to do amongst us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So just a, an, an offering moment um, go ahead, put the, um, the baptism picture up for me, please. Uh, you, were, you weren't able to see this last week. Uh, P Pastor Nathan uh, baptized three young adults, Aiden, Joshua, and Olivia. Um, what we do around here is about people. Then you were, if you were in worship here last week, I, I had the joy of baptizing Dalton, uh, uh, who is, from my perspective, a young, uh, a young guy that, that the Lord has touched his heart. He's committed to walking with Jesus. This is what we're about here. We're about people in the mission and ministry of God. Of, of God. Uh, you know, I, 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 I thought about Acres of Hope. This is Mother's Day, and, and that's a place we, we support uh, tremendously, and, and, they, and they're a home for, for moms who have no place to go with, with their kids. Finally, everything we do is about people, uh, and, and our, the offerings that we bring is, is, is what supports all this. Um, so if you want to be a part of this, all right. Uh, if if you want that privilege of being able to do that, you can you can uh, you can give a number of ways here at St. Matthew in person, online. You can text us or by mail. And you know, if not here, find another place where you can be a part of bringing uh, the the hope and message of Jesus Christ in the world and support that place. Uh, but be a part of it because it's a great a great privilege. So fine, just, just a couple of announcements. I, I, I got to grab this. I'm sorry about this. But a, a couple of things I didn't want to forget. At, um, for all women today, as you leave, <coughs> we have this little gift. Uh, it's, it's a pen and, and uh, uh, a place to take notes. And the pen has, there, each one has a different uh, Bible verse on it. Uh, the, I think this one talks about love. Let's see here. Uh, for with God, nothing, okay, with God, nothing shall be impossible. So the first one was about love. This one, with God, nothing shall be impossible. They'll hand these out as you leave today. Make sure you grab one. It's just a way for us to remember this gift that God has given us and to honor you. Uh, and, and so j just grab one, and, and may, may God remind you uh, of your calling and where you're irreplaceable in the lives of, of those around you. Uh, and then also... Um, if you haven't uh, grabbed one of the uh, B Bible studies for this is just a, you, we read through the first 15 chapters of Acts, open questions. Uh, every day you do that, and then you grab somebody else, a small group or, or somebody you know to, to talk about it. Open questions means there's no right answers and no wrong answers, right? You just say what, what, how God is guide, guiding your heart, huh? So um, just a couple of announcements. We have the last session of our foundations classes uh, uh, that's on June 4th, Inspire Hope and Service. Pastor Nathan will be doing that. Remember, you don't have to take these in order, so you can, you can do it then. And all, then we'll have the joy on June 11th of receiving uh, new, new members uh, once again. Am I forgetting anything? Yeah. What am I forgetting? 
What's that? Oh, yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah, put that up, the congregational meeting. Whoa, you know what? I, I said this week, I said this in the first uh, service, and I said, I got to stand on my head with this because I haven't done this well. This is a cool thing. This is next week. We have one service, 930, the whole family. It's going to be a short service, uh, and then we're doing this congregation meeting, and that sounds a meeting. Who wants to come to a meeting? This is a celebration of what God's doing amongst us, and we're really going to celebrate uh, the servant, you know the little cups that I said had good food in them? Somebody put those together, man. Yeah. And so we're celebrating all these servants all around us, including you, and we're having a luncheon, and it's not a rubber chicken, okay? It's, it's a great thing. In fact, Chris and Dottie's putting it together, and I'm telling you, they did my, yeah, they, they did my son's wedding, and we're still talking about it almost 10 years later. So it's not a rubber chicken. It's cool stuff. Be a part of that as God leads you. We'd love to have you. We're going to have a great time. So did I stand on my head enough? I, I hope. Anyway, <laughs> receive uh, the blessing of our Lord. Um, may you know that you are and belong to the family of our Father. May you know that it's a gift in his son, Jesus Christ, and therefore absolutely certain. And may his spirit empower you to open your arms in those irreplaceable places in your life to bring others into this awesome family that we're all searching for, the family of belonging to God. Amen.